Okay, we're going to talk in this session for Integrity Capital about describing and defining our culture. And I called it Life at Integrity Capital. So there's 10 different things that we're going to go through. And it's really important for us to be able to use this not only for our own accountability that we're living this stuff out, but also as a way for us to be able to communicate with those that might be interested in working here as a way to describe life here. What is our culture like? And this will hopefully be a roadmap for you, not only to understand the pithy statements that you'll hear, but also to be able to describe it so that you can understand the definition of what we mean, because that's the first starting place. What do we mean when we say this? And then also the manifestation of that, maybe some layout, a little bit more clarity, and then also what it's not as well. So the first one that I think we're all very stacked hands on is I own it. And when we say I own it, what we mean is someone at the firm is modeling taking personal responsibility. Ironically, we just talked about that. They are owning it. And so the manifestation is if someone has made a mistake, dropped the ball, forgotten to follow through, they quickly own up to it. They don't soft sell it or make excuses, but immediately say, I take ownership of this. And then follow it up with how they are going to fix it in the future. We don't expect perfection but we do expect a working towards attitude that is proven by effort, right? So we don't, we're not going to expect someone just going to get it the first time, but at the same sense, we're on the other side of the coin, we want to see that someone's moving in a particular trajectory. Um, what it's not is it's, this does not mean that we continue to make the same mistake over and over and over and over again and never work towards resolution. Uh, this also does not mean that we expect it never to happen again as we are all human. So there's a sweet spot right in the middle of that, which is healthy. So that's what we mean. That's the manifestation. And that's what we do not mean when we say, I own it just for clarity sake. So before I move on to the next one, does anybody have any questions or comments? I wanna give a little bit of room for it before we move. Good. Okay. Uh, the second one in describing our culture would be managing priorities, not time. So managing priorities for our firm means being intentional in planning out your calendar to be focused on the things that have the most impact in your particular position slash department. So the manifestation is someone who's managing priorities well has their day, week, month, possibly laid out in advance. So they have clear goals and know what it takes to accomplish them for the allotted time. They're focused to drop the things that are not priorities fast and be laser focused on the things that have the greatest ROI, return on investment. Uh, this person is productive not just a busy body, right? There's a, there's a difference between productivity and busyness. Uh, they're focused, not frantic. They have clarity versus confusion. So what it's not is managing priorities does not mean you can get everything done, uh, but only the things that matter the most. This is also does not mean someone can just continue not getting things done and not be able to clearly account for why they did it. So there's again, a balance somewhere right in the middle. So that is managing priorities, not time. That's what we mean by it. That's sort of a manifestation, at least some sort of example. And then what we don't mean. So any comments or uh, things that I could clarify on that? Okay. Uh, the third one is successful failure, 70% and then run. 
So what we mean by that is successful failure for us means someone has identified an idea they have that could benefit the company and them. There is some risk involved. Uh, they've gathered enough information to feel confident and then took action to make it become a reality. There is a chance the idea will not work out, but our firm celebrates the fact that they saw something that could add value they gathered 70% of the information, so to speak, and then they took a chance. So someone in the firm identifies a new way that they can make their job easier and increase the efficiency of the firm. They realize that if they did this, it could possibly not work and mess up the existing process. So they decide to interview a few internal people as well as some clients to see how this might benefit them. Once they've gotten enough feedback, they decide to begin implementing it. After several weeks, they realize it is not working the way that they thought it could in their mind. They reach out to their manager and begin walking through the auditing process to find out what happened, why it happened, and how they could learn from it going forward. The end result is an empowering moment of growth. What it's not is successful failure does not mean Someone could just keep making the same mistake over and over and not learn from it uh, with the intention of growing, sort of going back to the earlier comment as well. So any questions around successful failure, 70% and run or comments? Okay. So the fourth one is candid but gracious. So we say candid but gracious, we mean that we are verbally, we verbally, key here, are discussing what is real with ourselves, coworkers, shareholders, clients, and even the community. When we share what is real, we are doing it in a very gracious, kind, respectful tone and explaining the reasons behind the reality and having their best interest in mind. So an example, so you're talking with a coworker who has not been following through with the timelines you've agreed to. This has become a pattern and you feel it is necessary to address this as it would be in the company's and their best interest. Once you have thought through the best way to approach it, you ask them if they have some time to meet so you can discuss something. You sit down with them and begin to discuss your observations about things that haven't been getting done in the agreed timelines and ask some curious questions. Uh, you respectfully listen and gather more information about why this is happening and can share your concerns as well. The result is an agreement to approach things differently in the future and all parties walk away refreshed, encouraged and feeling respected. What it's not is candid but gracious is not being blunt, rude, snarky uh, or exemplifying any passive aggressive behavior. So that's what we mean when we say candid, but gracious for our culture. So any comments around that one or questions? Okay. Better together working collaboratively to win. So we say better together at our firm, we mean we are striving to work as a team in all we do, knowing that by doing so, we will achieve greater things. So someone at the firm is gathering other people to work on a project. They're presenting an idea and then gaining consensus to find out different ideas or opinions. In this exercise, they're finding ways to think differently, move faster, create new innovations and deepen the relationship. This should be woven into the fiber of how we work as one unit, as opposed to a bunch of little pieces. Uh, each person has giftings that make up a whole body. Uh, what it's not is it does not mean that we can't function on our own, but we work independently. We are doing so with results that affect the whole. So that's what we mean when we say better together and working collaboratively to win. So any questions about that? Okay. 
you matter to me. So when we say you matter to me, it means that we care about the person working here and or the client we're working with as not just a thing that produces results, but as a person who is intrinsically valuable and worthy of knowing more. So people who work here and the client should feel like they really matter. The way this manifests is in that people are asking questions, remembering special days or moments, understanding their deepest desires and longings, finding out what excites them and is their passion. We can laugh together, weep together, work hard together, speak respectful truth to one another, and much, much more. Uh, what this doesn't mean is that we all need to be best friends uh, or that is an excuse not to produce results. So that's what we mean when we say you matter to me. So any comments or questions about that? Okay, handing the baton to the next. So handing the baton to the next mean, means we are continually working on mentoring the next person in line to replace your position so that you can keep growing. This might seem scary at first, but it should not be. If you do this well, then it is the best job security you will ever have as you are focused on adding value, not self-preservation. So in your position, it should be part of your growth plan to be pouring into someone else. Who am I teaching, training, reviewing, coaching, and helping to grow? This should happen on an intentional basis and organically. This is a culture part of growth and training so that everyone here really becomes a leader. Um, what this does not mean is that you do this at the expense of performing your job. Uh, as it's the optimal position. Um, so can I answer any questions about that? Or is there anything that you guys want to say around handing the baton to the next? Okay. The next one is innovation comes out of frustration. Uh, innovation comes out of frustration means we're continually looking at areas, processes, products, and partnerships that create frustration and then asking the question, how could we solve this, improve this, and come up with a better way? Um, you will consistently run into a process that will create some frustration for you. The frustration might come from the lack of responsiveness from a borrower, too many steps, something that's too slow, clients that waste your time, things that go sideways and the list goes on. When you see these things happen, your response should be A, to acknowledge that it's frustrating so you can embrace reality. B, get excited and ask how you could solve this. C, write up a list of a few ways you see this getting solved. D, contact a coworker or manager to brainstorm and collaborate to innovate. And E, put it in action so that you can test it and then finally F, review it later to see if it worked and then run the cycle again if it doesn't. What this doesn't mean is that you need to do a massive project every time you run into a little frustration. Um, you should only keep your attention on one thing at a time and take things in bite sizes so that you can see progress. So that's what we mean when we say innovation that comes out of frustration. You guys have been pretty quiet, so I'm not even asking you if you need any questions. <laughs> um, so be lean and nimble. Uh, being nimble and lean means we run a place that is financially healthy and no bad debt, and that we run an organization where decisions can get made with little red tape. So in real life, we make uh, financial decisions that help us invest heavily in areas that give the greatest return and spend less money on things that don't. For example, we want to invest heavily in our people, technology, R&D, education, marketing, leadership, and the like. We want to spend less things on those things that are fancy offices or over-the-top marketing gimmicks, et cetera. As for decisions, we want to promote our people to latch on to what we call the type one and type two decisions. We've done a whole 
teaching on this, type one decisions are ones that should defer to upper management as it deals with high impact items that are tough to unwind. So this could be something like hiring decisions or moving into a strategic market. Type two decisions are probably 85% of the operational decisions. They'll rarely have a large impact, but should be made without getting approval. So this, this would be solving problems for clients, coming up with new ideas, doing research, et cetera. And it's important that our people feel empowered to make choices and feel a part of the success of the firm. Uh, what this does not mean is that we make a choice that would harm the company's reputation by speaking too soon or implementing an unethical decision. And finally, the last one is to know and delight the person we serve. So knowing and delighting the person we serve means doing everything to educate ourselves about the likes, dislikes, profile, and longings of our clients. So each interaction you have in dealing with a client is an opportunity to know and gather more about them. What's their birthday, anniversary, hobbies, worries, kids' names, season of life they're in, big wins in their life, deaths in their life, passions, temperament, and the like. We really want to know them so that they know we care about them and what happens to them. Furthermore, we want to find all the ways we can add tremendous value to their lives. What ways can we make things less burdensome, quicker, lower costs? The goal is to find ways to make them say, wow, that was an amazing experience working with your firm. What it's not is this does not mean we're gathering information to be manipulative in trying to take advantage of them or misusing the data that we do have. So that is really the 10 cultural tenets that we would best describe how we live, how we function, how we make decisions uh, and life here at Integrity Capital.